I realized they didn't have anything to say at the end there. The Degree the Podcast is brought to you by Soccer90.com, your ultimate destination for FC Dallas, North Texas Soccer Club, and all that sweet, sweet European gear. Check out the North Texas Soccer Club end of season sale for 50% off all that cool second team merch, the unique merch. No one else is going to have that. Hurry while the supplies last because there's a limited number of that stuff. The third degree listeners get 20% off at checkout when you use the code third degree. Some exclusions do apply. Well, hello there, FC Dallas Curious fan. Welcome to another episode of Third Degree, the podcast. This one is numbered 229. 229. Hi, I'm Peter, and we are without Dan today, who I think is very busy in the middle of getting his massive beer corn road i think is what i saw on tiktok somewhere uh, so hopefully dan will be back with us soon so that means it's just me and your hero of course my hero and everybody's hero editor founder of thirddegree.net he is the original buzz carrick come in buzz now see here i assumed that he just wasn't doing well with uh, luton you know being 0, <laughs> 0 and 4 <laughs> to start <laughs> the year yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And you know, I predicted Luton to stave off relegation. So, mm. and now I'm starting to see that the running, running theory in England is: will they be 0708 Derby bad, which is the worst performance in Premier League history? I, I I don't know a lot about Luton. To be fair, the one thing I do know is I think they kind of punched above their weight last year just yes. to get in here. Yes, so they may be. You know, there was a fair bit of punching above their weight going around last season. So, um, I mean, obviously, I'm cheering for them uh, for Dan's sake. You know, I, I would I would love for them to stay up. It's going to be very difficult, though. I'm uh, holding out hope for the Hatters uh, as well, my friends. So we'll see how that goes. They got um, uh, who do they have this weekend? I, I actually wrote this one down somewhere. Where was it? Wolves, Luton, isn't it? Luton has. Um, oh, yeah. Wolves. Yes. Yes. So come on, you know, they got to break through somehow. Got to be Wolves. The Wolves is like the second leakiest defense in the league so far. So maybe this is where they get there. It's a big one for them if because yeah. that's down near the bottom. That's right. Um, you know, Buzz, you know, if, if we could ever do it, if there was ever a way to pull it off, getting to go to a Luton game with Dan, the mm. three of us would be yeah. amazing. Yeah. I don't think it's in the current third degree budget, though. <laughs> come on patreons <laughs> yeah. fund our boys trip to <laughs> yeah which has nothing to do Luton. with dallas but come on <laughs> send us money <laughs> we'll do a yeah. show from a pub in london sometime yeah. oh we for sure would do that all right so here we are buzz uh on the i i, I guess we can call this a victory pod because uh, yeah. dallas went on the road and won last night buzz this was the first time dallas has scored three goals in a road game since when when uh september of last season against um at minnesota and this is a four-point pod because they even tied the game on saturday against oh saturday. no and i haven't gotten there yet oh i'm jumping the gun on my bad yeah yeah, yeah no yeah. no yeah yeah you're just jumping ahead i was gonna ask did they win that game in minnesota i believe that was that pretty comprehensive uh three one kind of win ah, uh, remember yes, at the end of last yes. year where this we thought they were kind of slipping and all of a sudden they went out and punch drunk minnesota up there in minnesota it was a big huge win yeah, here's the thing, though, Buzz. The Seattle game, which you mentioned, they did get a draw, but that was one of those draws at home. Everybody leaves and gets in the car and punches the dashboard and is all upset because it was another game where Dallas gave up points late. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And and so because the last game is the win, I, I I feel like everybody's current state of mind is positive, but I have a feeling if you were to flip the orders of these games mm. – Everybody's attitude about the team would be different. You know how this goes, right? Oh, yeah. yeah it's yeah. just kind of what this team is. Yeah. Oh, oh. Th this is the history of FC Dallas. <laughs> you know, honestly, we've never really seen uh, that I can remember like a really truly convincing team, even when they, Oscar was in charge here. It just, you, you would have these moments of letdown, you know, and, and, and these moments that would remind you that you're um, fallible, you know, and, and, Certainly Seattle was one of those games. They, this particular team just struggles to put together a comprehensive, complete game. If you remember last year, in fact, when they had this game, it was the same sort of way. When they went to Minnesota, they scored those three goals in four minutes. 
if you remember, it was like 55, 56, 58. Yeah, that's right. Like yeah, fastest three in club history or something like that. I remember that now. So, you know, even that game, when you look back on when was the last time they had a result like this, it was the same sort of thing. Like, it's not a full, complete, flawless game. It's just got moments. And particularly on the road, they did this This game looks just like that game in a lot of ways. And they stifle the game for a big stretch. And they get their opportunities on a quick transition. They take advantage and then they keep going and they get a second one, you know, and it's, 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 uh, none of it looks incredibly sexy. This team is just not a sexy football team. They're a they're a game. They're, they're a team that grinds, keeps the games really tight and low scoring. You know, it's never going to be, um, or, or very rarely is it a blowout kind of thing, particularly on the road. And that's why this the second one, the win, really does put you on such a massive high. You know, because it's not like the Seattle game was brutal. The first half was solid, but it was the second half that was particularly bad in that game. And so it's these moments or these halves or even if you look at the RSL game when they allowed that goal late in the first half, that's such a letdown moment. Like you you had a fairly decent half in terms of keeping them out. I mean, they were the better team in the first half, but, you know, you, you had kept it from, from getting out of control because your keeper's really good. So, you know, again, this team is not – they're not the top of the echelon. You know, they, they grind and they fight and they get some results and sometimes they make you feel decent walking away. Yeah, I, I, that's what's weird about these two games because, as you mentioned, they're both games of two halves, that yeah, cliche that we love sure. to use in soccer, except they were in reverse order. Seattle, they played well in the first half and then farted away in the second. And in the Salt Lake game, they were terrible in the first half, especially in the last 15 minutes. Yeah or so and then something happened and a switch flipped and they were kind of like a completely different team in the second half and and i personally just can't put my finger on it other than it's just some sort of collective mental state that the team kind of uh falls in and out of yeah i think i think actually the um rsl one the first half is more typical fc dallas because they have this tendency uh, in fact, to give up goals in the late in the last 15 minutes of the first half, they've given up 10 goals in that last 15 minutes, which is a third of the, all the goals they've given up the whole year uh, coming in that last 15 minutes. Of the first half or of the second half? half? Oh, first half. wow. wow. So cl- okay. clearly there's a trend where for some reason they sort of shut down at the end of the first half of games and allow teams to get these goals. And then you might feel like maybe Dallas is a team that does that late, but the opposite is true of late. They, they've outscored opponents – something like, I don't have it right in front of me, like 11 to 6 in the last 15 minutes of the games because they keep games tight. They keep themselves in it. And they have the ability to score a late goal uh, to tie or to win a game. So really the RSL game is a prototypical FC Dallas game in that they 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 keep it tight and they keep it tough in the first half. They manage to squeeze through it mostly except that they break down the last little bit of the first half and then the second half they rally. That's, that's this team's MO. Uh, I want to make an analogy because I felt this is kind of where I was uh, thinking about this today, uh, trying to figure out how I wanted to talk about this team on the podcast. And this is going to sound like a stupid analogy, but here I go anyway. My my wife recently bought a new car. and She bought a Subaru Outback. And it's the most practical vehicle we've ever owned. Yeah. It does exactly what she needs it to do to get her from A to B in a perfectly fine fashion. But it's boring, Buzz. It's the most <laughs> boring car we've ever owned. It's not particularly attractive, uh, but but it's it's a high value and it does what it's supposed to do. But man, driving it is an absolute snooze. But I've come to under I've come to appreciate the fact that it's just a wonderfully practical. It just does what it needs to do kind of thing. Yeah, and that's how I've come to feel about the 2023 version of FC Dallas, which is. This team is an absolute bore to watch. There is nothing exciting about this club, and it's because of its design and the way Nico manages this thing. But I also appreciate the fact that that may be what keeps this thing churning along. This team was so much fun to watch last season, Buzz. It was so exciting and had such high potential, and there were great moments of attacking play, and it's so... It's such. It's so weird to me how different this team is in terms of uh, the evaporation of the excitement level. And I and I guess the reasoning is is because this is what the coach feels that he needs to do to figure out a way to get into an extended playoff run. But man, it's just not fun to watch at all. Yeah, it's weird because 
the, the differences in this team from in terms of personnel from last year to this year is basically like they got rid of Matt Hedges. Right. Should, should have affected the offense. Um, you know, they even had had uh, Lejet come in at the end of that season and do some good things. It, clearly this season, what's missing is the fall off from Paul Areola and from Lejet. You know, the, 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 the little something extra that those guys were giving you that made the thing click and flow and feel more fun offensively. Now you only get that in little bursts. You get that in quick transition. It's almost like they've chosen to, I don't even know what it is, because certainly it wasn't trading away Brandon Cervania. That's not what changed everything. You know, Alan Velasco has matured. That should be better. You know, Bernie's come in and looked like he's got a little something. That That's a little nice, but none of that stuff is making it sexy. The midfield, other than the injuries, the midfield is the same. But, you know, we can even go back to the first third of the season when the, immediately they were playing better. They weren't playing sexy. So I don't know whether – I don't know what changed, honestly, other than, like, just a couple of guys didn't have – the crazy, amazing. I mean, Paul Arreola had a career year last year. He is not this year. So, you know, and it's not just him. I don't want to put it all on him. You know, the, the Legette also is not performing at the same level he was. No, you Paxton, know, Paxton stopped, has yeah. got a little, was a little more hurt this year. Has regressed a little bit, you know, looked good in the last couple of games. I'll give him that, you know, now that he's maybe a little bit more healthy again, you know, just, yeah, the uh, Farfan coming forward on the left, same guy. You know, I mean, the only difference is like Nanu's gone. <laughs> I'm sure that the Nanu Giovanni <laughs> Jesus isn't the difference. <laughs> totally Tomasi's forgot about Nanu. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Tomasi's still here. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't. Other than you know, listen, the margins in Major League Soccer are so thin. Yeah. Look at the point difference in the Western Conference. If you don't think just Paul Areola going from career year to a mediocre year for whatever reason, including the massive injury that he suffered isn't worth like six points in the standings, you know, that's yeah. the difference between second and 10th, you know? Yeah. I, I, I'm a big, I, I'm a full believer that the real cause of all of this is the downfall of Areola and Legette, which is yeah. impactful for two reasons. One, it's, it's a problem on the field for obvious reasons, but it's also a problem off the field because the club spent so much money to bring those guys in. We were so excited that the club went out and did something so, um, different in terms of what this club typically, this club does not historically go out and get in league players as yeah. they did with these two guys and, and big name players, at least re I, I would say, uh, would you give Ariola and legit, like maybe a B plus a minus great, you know, level of yeah. value in the league and the, the national team pool guys, friend. Yeah. You okay. Know, not starters, but on the fringe of the being important. Sure. Yeah. So that was a huge deal last year. And I do believe they were a big part of the reason why this team was so much fun to watch. So for whatever the reason was, both those guys fell off this season. I That's my running theory as to why this feels and looks so much different this year. Yeah. And I think you could, strangely enough, point both of those guys and, and listen, I'll give them credit for trying to get solid, really productive American domestic God, this is how you build a quality team. You, you, if you get really quality Americans, you can put a couple of really quality foreign players around and be a really good team in this league. But I think you could also bizarrely point at off-field things for both of those guys falling off. Yeah, I mean, exactly. The, the, the celebrated legit debacle. We don't need to dig out too deep into that, but you know what happened with him and his personal life. Uh, Areola, the World Cup thing had to be a kick in the balls, right? You know, and we've talked about the other things in his life that are awesome things that still cause stress. And then he has the big injury. You know, you certainly, I think you can put a lot of it onto those guys in a way, long term, being a next season or two. I'm not super concerned about those guys in terms of hopefully recovering because I think we've seen a little signs of legit life coming back before he got hurt. And we've seen a little bit of signs of Ariola coming back now now that he's back from being hurt. So I, I'm not super worried about like a three-year death zone because of this, but uh, it's just a really weird season because of those two massive, massive pieces having these arguably yeah. off-field problems that are causing the root of their troubles. Yeah, but I think we're probably about to find out that Legette's done for a while that, oh, yeah. there's lots of there's lots of hot rumor reports that his injury is way worse and they just haven't told anybody yet yeah a hamstring can be so tough because you don't know how bad it's torn really 
Um, and you know, th those can go from like a week or two to like months and months without blinking an eye if it goes wrong. So, um, the fact that they're not really saying much does make me a little worrisome. I don't want to go any further than that because I don't know anything about it really other than just rumor. But, um, you know, if, if they just say like, oh, it's gonna be a week or two, then you don't think much about it. But the fact they haven't said anything makes me wonder. Yeah, I guess the only upside is, is that despite the fact that he had come out of his shell a little bit in the last month or so, they've largely played this entire season without him. Yeah, basically. Well, they have. Much, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't he wasn't that great when the season started, and then we no. kind of all found out why he wasn't great when yeah. the season started. Then all the news came out, and he just kind of fell into this pit uh, and never really uh, surfaced out of it. So if he's gone for the rest of the season or for an extended period of the rest of the season, I I don't know if you could have really counted on it anyway. So well, he got off to the wrong foot. If you remember, he got hurt twice in preseason. He basically had no preseason. You yeah. Know? So he was coming into the regular season behind everybody trying to catch up it just it just got off the wrong foot and then went sideways fast and and i, I you know they, they've got so much money invested in those two guys you really just at a franchise is going to have to hope that those guys recover and have decent seasons next year you know or that's a, let's maybe not burn that bridge yet but um in the back of your mind it has to be consideration given that you're looking at a million five two and a million in salary on two guys that you worry about you know yeah for sure uh, one of the things that you talked about in both of your instant reaction videos that you do after the game and post mm -hmm. on social media was in the Seattle game first, it was like red flag, red flag, Jesus and this team are on different page. What's going on? And we've all been very worried about Jesus uh, and his performance with this team since returning from the national team. And uh, then in the RSL game, I'll have to admit in the first, I don't know, uh, first half I didn't think he was much better he was <laughs> it, it was a black hole of a player for a long time but the second half he came to life and everything felt yeah. good again and he scored a couple of goals what's going on with that oh uh, boy sometimes it's so hard to know you know he's always been a player that hasn't had amazing body language but the, in the Seattle game in particular the thing that was really disturbing to me was that he would the passes it was not just him it's a two-way street the passes to him and from him were just missing they were like they would be a step behind they'd be a step ahead or they would just misfire a little bit or he'd make a run into the same space somebody else was making a run into or he wouldn't go and the other person wouldn't go and then nobody would go into that space there was just sort of a i don't want to say lack of communication because I, I wouldn't put it on that it was just uh, so sometimes you just get out of sorts with people out of vibe or out of cohesiveness for whatever reason. That game against Seattle was like the worst I've ever seen it. And he was starting to get really frustrated, I think, towards the end of the game. And then the bizarrely against Salt Lake in the first half, he, he was struggling in the sense of like nothing was coming off. But but those those miscues were gone, like the, the, the double runs were gone. The passes being off were, were gone. And then obviously he came to life in the second half and it just really and I'm probably getting the PK was a huge catalyst for him. But just even in front of that, like the connectivity with the, with the rest of his team was back and he was on the same page with everybody else. And that was so nice to see because I was really worried, uh, you know, not like uh, red alert worry, but I was starting to get concerned in the Seattle game and then coming out of the RSL game, even part way through the RSL game, I felt much better about it. You know, cause it was just... The Seattle game, the formation was off. That might be part of it. There was a tactical off that was just driving me crazy. And it may have been a contributing factor to why that was not working. Because it was rough watching that Seattle game. <laughs> Jesus in particular. Was, I, was, I, was, I felt so bad for the guy. I was like, this is just brutal. Well, let's talk a little bit about tactics and the difference between the Seattle and RSL games. Yeah. Um, I, look, we can harp on a lot of negative things, but I do feel like especially for these two games the one really exciting thing is uh elara who elara mendy who just continues to be like oh a gosh. really top-notch addition to this club so you got an ansa who uh, apparently isn't even good enough to play uh that you pull in and make a big deal out as a summer signing but then you got this guy and it kind of balances out because he's really really good and you kind of hope he sticks around for another season Oh man, the Seattle game uh, just blew me away. I couldn't believe how good he was. I'm not necessarily a hardcore numbers guy, but I think in this case, I can throw some numbers at you from the Seattle game that are just ridiculous. He had 84 touches, which led FC Dallas. 92% passing out of a guy playing as a deep eight, but still a central midfielder. 92% passing is ridiculous. 
He had 38 carries, which led FC Dallas. Two progressive dribbles, which led FC Dallas. 12 progressive passes, which led FC Dallas. By the way, the next best guy had four, and he had 12. Seven passes into the final third, that led FC Dallas. And he had eight recoveries, and that led FC Dallas. So he just dominated the whole field in pretty much every category you would want out of a central midfielder in that game. It was just ridiculous how good he was in that game. And he carried it over again. I couldn't believe he started again against RSL, frankly, because the guy's, what, 34 you know, or 32, somewhere in that neck of the woods. Sorry, I don't remember this by the second, but like you're worried when you have seven games in 22 day, days to play a guy like that game after game after game. At altitude, at, by oh, the way. Man, that worries me a lot. So I was really surprised they didn't rotate him out. They really couldn't rotated Facundo instead, who again, another player that probably needed a break too. So the dude is just, there was a moment in, um, I think it was the Seattle game where Ibiaga had picked up the ball in the back, in the center back. And Yaramendi was roughly near midfield. And 99% of other central midfielders would have checked to Ibi to provide an outlet for him to distribute. And instead, Yaramendi like, looked to his left and looked to his right and picked, noticed that there was this gap. And he started backpedaling hard and was gesturing at Ibiaga. Come, 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 come. And he, and he made Ibiaga dribble like 30 yards up into the middle of the field drawing him forward. And I was like that field awareness and shape awareness and tactical awareness of that moment to do something that nobody else would have done to me. That's the kind of thing that makes my soccer synapses light up because it was, it's something as simple as recognizing that your center back should carry it instead of just whacking it to you. You know, a guy who's not necessarily a great dribbler or a passer, but you are like, dude, this is going to be, this is going to bring the whole field out and they're going to be caught deep and we're going to be going forward. It was just such a moment and it was a moment of nothing, but it was such a moment that made me so excited to see a guy that's thinking on that level. It's just ridiculous. He has uh, been a, it's a really nice player and he's not a big dude either. It's no. kind of surprising how slight he is and he appears to be very fit and uh, covers a ton of ground. And uh, I, I really have been, I mean, look, I know he's on kind of this weirdo half season deal, um, I, and I, I, I feel like he's feeling out Dallas as much as Dallas is feeling him out. Uh, is that, does that sound right? Buzz in terms yeah. of playing next season? Like, he's like, do I really want to do this? I'll play it a half season, see how it goes kind of thing. Yeah. That probably was a two way street where both parties felt, you know, I'll do this year and then there's an option for next year. So Dallas could pick him up whether he wants to or not. I guess he could retire on them or something, but, um, you know, Dallas, I, I, I can't imagine unless the escalator is just insane. I can't imagine that they wouldn't pick him up. You know, I think that the, I think you can already see an influence on Paxton from th this guy. It, he strikes me so much of like I imagine one of the first things he said to people was the thing Messi said: "Quit running so much," because it's not <laughs> like you look at Iramandi and he's just busting his butt gut all over the field, right? He's just right. always in the right position. I would be I'd be interested in, except I don't want to actually do it when I'm watching a live game. I'd be interested to see how many times he just steps five yards forward and just picks up a ball and in clean space and just turns it back in because he does that over and over again. So the same thing Job Hollow does that gets me so excited when I watch him play. Yeah, many does it too. There's so many times when the timing of his five yard step into a gap or to turn back a defender or to pick up a ball is so good. Uh, it's just, it's just amazing to watch. You know, and this is the thing that's convinced me more than ever that yes, look, MLS is better than it's ever has been. But when you have a guy that's coming from a 10-year, you know, Serie A career or La Liga career or EPL career, it's there's still another level, right? Clearly. Oh, sure. And this yeah. guy clearly demonstrates that to me. And I'm not talking about just – I'm talking about the mind, not, not the touch or whatever else that you would expect. You know, it's just ridiculous how he's thinking about the game differently than – everybody that is from here does look, look at Billy Sharp playing for the galaxy. I mean, that's a guy that has been walling around in English soccer for a, what feels like a hundred years. And he shows up for the galaxy and he's just banging beautiful goals. in. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I mean, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in MLS. I think it's closer yes. than people think, but there is still a big step. Yes. Yeah. It's still hundred percent gap for sure. All right. The other thing that I wanted to talk about, because I think this has happened very quietly and not a lot of people have discussed it is these last two games have also featured something that I think many of us have wanted to see for a very long time, which is Paxton kind of playing the 10. A bit, yeah, weirdly. Kind of Although, centrally attacking yeah. um, midfielder, and I don't know if you could really call it a 10, but we all no. have 
for a long time assumed that was Paxton's real kind of man. We could just get him in that spot. Yeah. And he's played that position the last two games. Well, part of it is that Yaramendi, uh, by nature, just immediately drops into a double pivot. Um, it was worse with Facundo than it was with Frazier because Frazier plays so deep. But um, weirdly, and particularly the first half against Seattle, which is funny because that's when they were actually better, Paxton was so out of sorts that like he spent the entire first half playing like right mid on top of Junka. <laughs> so I was like, I was complaining about it. I was like, what is he doing? Uh, he needs to get back into like an eight kind of position. And he started, he, they fixed it in the second half and then a bunch of other stuff went sideways in it. So the whole second half wasn't very good. And then against Salt Lake, this was what was crazy is they were flexing in and out of formations. So in possession, Dallas was in a 4-3-3. And then in defense, they were in a 4-4-2. And Paxton and Jesus were playing the two high positions in defense. And Obreon and, and, and Areola were sitting back on top of the wide spots, making the 4-4-2 when they were in defense. Mm -hmm. So at first I thought, man, Paxton's going to have to do so much running. But really he didn't because – the formation would flex sort of around him. Jesus would go up and Paxton would kind of just stay where he was and he would by the nature of the moving formation, he would become an eight instead of like this high 10 thing. He was sort of flexing back and forth. So he actually ran less than normal, which was surprising in its execution. Maybe how he started two games back to back. Yeah, when was the last, be. when was the last time Paxton started two games back to back? Oh man, it's probably been a while. I honestly would have to look. It didn't occur to me to think about that. Um, you know, again, I think there's some ear and influence I think this tactical formation against RSL leans into Paxton in the sense of like, stop overworking yourself. I mean, that'd be the one thing I would have told Paxton for the last three year, years if he would have asked me to stop running so much, you know, like what Messi told that kid in uh, right. Miami, which is so funny to me, you know, cause you can burn yourself out and, and he does. And he always has. And, and I know that they think about the fact they can't really start Paxton back to back to back to back games, you know, and now yet here he is. And, it's a fascinating process to watch them try and work around what are again, some heavy injuries. Uh, and when we get to the game this weekend, it's going to be really fascinating, but Paxton's had really in a way, way back to back, pretty positive games. You know, I, I don't think he's ever going to be the playmaking 10 that we thought he was going to be, you know, the free aid, the, the, the De Bruyne we thought it was going to be, but I think he can be a really good serviceable, uh, you know, Gerard style box to box guy. I think that's still in there. Uh, not that level, of course, but, you know, uh, so still a quality player in there if you can figure out how to be healthy and maintain himself. This is also the uh, moment in the podcast where I have to uh, do the right thing because if Ansa or somebody else had done uh, this, we'd all be kind of like, man, that was really good. But Obreon, two games in a row, kind of good hot air. <laughs> Good performances <laughs> for the most part. I mean, there's yeah. still certainly those cowbell moments that drive you crazy, but he scored the goal against Seattle. He won a couple of balls and uh, assisted here in the Salt Lake game. He, you know, earned the PK. It's yeah. Earned yeah. the PK. And it's not like, and to be fair, it's not like anybody else is doing it out on the left wing. So <laughs> you, know, you got to give him credit. Yeah. These are, these are two good and the, and the RSL one in particular is what we call a good Obreon game. Now <laughs> that's not a good Paul Areola game. It's a good Obreon game. So it's not I, even I mean, a good mid-level MLS yeah. player game. <laughs> and there's a context here that we're dealing with, you know, it's not the same, but for Obreon, this was a strong performance. You know, there, there's definitely holes, uh, but he was a factor in, you know, all, all the good things that were happening for Dallas last night, he was a factor in a lot of them in terms of being maybe not the direct assist, but maybe the second assist or earning the PK, you know, or in the outright assist on the third goal. So, you know, that was a productive Obreon game. If he played like that every game, you might be able to have a conversation about keeping the guy. But, you know, no. it's just that it's so inconsistent. And there are these big stretches where, you know, he's not very good. And usually he does it to himself. Like when he gets in a run of good games, all of a sudden something happens, you know, with something on the field or something off the field. And then you know, it's, it's down the run again. And now we're watching a bad run again. And the weird thing is that something Dunny said on the show is I don't know. He'd even be starting if you know, uh, Bernie was hurt the way Bernie was playing. I think he would have kept that spot. And if Velasco was healthy, he might not be out there either. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I, look, it is a, it, in crazy importance to the the plight of this season that they won that game last night. Yeah. 
because uh, now that sticks them with the other results from the night. That sticks them in ninth place. So four points over the two games salvages to some degree. Were they in ninth place before they those 10th. two? They were no, no before the before these two games. They were in tenth. I believe I so. They, yeah, they were out of the playoffs. Oh, I thought they were a ninth before the Seattle game. Anyway, maybe. Um, but man, they got oh, good lord, a hill to climb for the rest of this month. They've got the game against Columbus on Saturday, and Columbus is a good side. Then they go on the road to Philadelphia, which is that game that got canceled because of the League's Cup and got yeah. rescheduled here. So now it's wedged between that and then, oh, Lord, I am not looking forward to this, a trip to Houston because, lo and behold, as much hilarity as watching Austin mm -hmm. suck as bad as they do watching Houston play entertaining soccer in the manner they are at this particular moment is really painful to see yeah well the 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 positive things are the two games in hand on most of the teams and I hate playing the games in the hand card but if you can get a couple of points out of you know or even win those two games you can make a big move in the standings as tight as they are right you know they're on 38 there's six points behind third place you know, but they're also four points ahead of 12th. So you're going to have to finish out the season legit strong. The the game, any home game is a massive, massive, almost a must win at this point. Any home game at all, you know, going to Philly is going to be really, really difficult. The thing about this team though, is that if Martin Paws plays like he did against RSL, you're going to have a chance to win everything, you know, because that was a ridiculous performance. I think he had six saves. I think it was, and not just like, little easy pickup saves, like some absolute bangers that he stopped. You know, if your oh, defense yeah. holds up and he plays like that and Jesus shows up and plays like that, you're going to win a bunch of games and you're going to be fine. If those two things don't happen, then you're not going to be fine. You know, it's, it's got, it's really become that simple. And you know, when, when, as good as some of these teams are, they have come up. It's not easy. Houston's good. Columbus is good. Philly's good. That's a tough stretch, but if it's, Zero zero or one one going into the final fifteen, you know you're giving yourself a, a real shot to get some points and win some games. Yeah, the interesting thing about Saturday is because of all the mileage, the travel, having been having just played at altitude, and and figuring out who's going to play against Columbus. Because of the next three games, the Columbus game is the one that actually has uh, somewhat winnable written on it. Because Columbus is not a good road team, by the way. Uh, Columbus, despite being third in the league, have a road record of three eight and three. So uh, it would be great if Dallas could figure out a way to get collect points on that before having to go to ro go to two back to back yeah. road games in two of you know places that are very unlikely to get points out of. And I, and I think if you look at Dallas's home record, you know over the last year, I think they've lost three games at home, you know this season combined, and it's it's been a, you can go back even further before they lost another game at home before that. They have a really good home performance record. So that's what I mean by like home games become must win. And when you look at a game, a team like Columbus, who, as you say, is not a great performing road team. It's like, you got to win this one, man. This yeah. can't, because you can't look at Philly as like, oh, I'm going to go there and do something. If you go there and do something at all, that's pure bonus. That's a stolen anything because Philly is really good and they're really good at home. So they're not like RSL who's like 500 at home. Philly's nine, one and three at home. So they've lost once there all year. You know, uh, listen, Dallas is always going to be in every game. They keep it tight, right? That's their MO. But that doesn't mean, like, you can expect to go there and do something. So you've got to take care of these home games. When you, when you look at the schedule, you've got Columbus at home, you've got Colorado at home, and San Jose at home. Those three games could be it. You know, that could be the difference between getting in or not. Because you really don't want to have to go to L.A. on the final game of the season, even though you have a two-week break before you do it from the, this, this tough stretch to that game. You don't want to have to go out there because they're probably going to be right in a fight with you. Buzz. That ain't going to be an easy game. Buzz. Yeah. You know it's coming down to the L.A. game. I know, but that's why you got, you can't let it. you got to be more aggressive Buzz. with that. It's coming down <laughs> to the L.A. Galaxy game. Yeah. That probably is. <laughs> There's abs it is it is the script writers wrote it down when they made the schedule. It's coming down to a game in Carson. It absolutely yeah. is. No there's just no question about it. I mean LA's five points back, but they have two games in hand also, you know, so like they have an opportunity to close the gap and put themselves in contention. The yes. only team that's out of it is Colorado. It's like the entire West is in play. You know, I mean LA can't get to third, but you know, almost anybody else can, you know, 
Now it's not likely because the teams between you and the top are not going to all crater, you know. So that's that's going to be the thing that's going to prevent Dallas from moving far. But you know, anyone from Vancouver at forty-one down is probably within reach. You know, you only have to get ahead of one or two of them to keep yourself in. You know, so we'll see. It's going to be right under the wire. Yeah, another uh, just a quick uh, mention about something else that happened last night in the Salt Lake game that I thought was, I think we all saw it and we all fist pumped and cheered, but I also worry that <laughs> I hope it didn't put him in a bad way with the with the uh, with his manager. Was when they, I do, it looked like Nico was trying to sub to Farai off when yeah. they're trying to hold on to a lead. And Nikosi appeared to be going, no, dude, I'm fine. Yeah. He didn't just say, no, dude, I'm fine. He said, you're out of your goddamn mind. I am not coming out of the game. You know, maybe not literally, but that's effectively what he did. He, he effectively refused to come off. Now, maybe he reminded coach, hey, that's not what we talked about. We talked about doing three at the back, or maybe you should reconsider. But that was about as demonstrative as like, I'm not coming out of this game as I've ever seen. And I love that, actually. I, I do, too. Yeah. I, I love a dude who's emerging and has now knows exactly how good he is and knows he's the team's best defender and knows he needs to be on the field and knows how good he feels at any particular moment. He was, I'm sure that this was not what the coach intended because he was, he didn't start the game before. So he should have been perfectly rested in terms of going 90 minutes. And he only came off the bench the previous game. So there's no reason at all. He should have been subbed out of that game. I was like, you're out of your mind. What are you doing? And he was perfectly right to say, I'm not coming out. You're making a mistake. This is not what's happening. And if I find if, if we find out that that is indeed what he did, I love it even more. I hope he really did refuse to come off because that's what I love in a player. Because I, I also feel like this is something that we don't have enough of a conversation about with uh, pertaining Miko, which is his weird sensitivity about rotation and rest and it almost feels like he's reluctant to push players physically in terms of, especially, I don't, like, I don't understand why he feels the need to rotate center back so much. I just, I, I he's yeah. got two, I mean, look, Nikosi should be starting until, like, game after game. I, there's no reason in my mind when you're trying to make the playoffs for Nikosi to sit a game for the rest of the season. He's, what, 21, 22, what is he, 24? Oh, is he that old? Yeah. Okay. He's 26. Still prime of his career. He can play every, he can play two games a week or th three games in seven days, yeah. whatever it is. He can do it. The other two guys, maybe not so much, No. but to far I can. And I think he thinks he can. Yeah, for sure. I, I agree with you hundred percent. Um, sometimes when I watch, um, premier league play, I'm, I, I sometimes find myself surprised that like the back four almost never changes. I know like, we watch teams game after game, after game, after game, the back four is the same. And like, there's no like worry about this or that. Now I will admit that in Texas, maybe it's a little bit hotter. And I remember last year, Farfan, at the end of the season broke down like the last five or six games. Farfan was rough because he got asked to play too much. So there is that, but Nikosi is in the best shape of his life. And he's one of the best in shape players on the entire team. So I'm not at all worried about him playing a pretty heavy load, you know, especially because it's starting to cool off now. Like you should be able to go ham on the guy now. You know, it's, it's not like he's, uh, you know, a wide midfielder that's running 14 miles a game. He's a center back, you know, it's different. Even outside backs have a much more or greater responsibility in terms of the amount of ground they got to cover than a center back does. You know, it's, I'm not saying they don't run. I'm just saying, like, they don't have the workload that some right. of the other guys do in terms of, like, cardio up and down, up and down, down, down. So I'm with you. I Like, at this point, particularly because you had not started him against Seattle, there's no question he should have been the whole time. And I think part of it is with Nicosia, the first look at his face, like, was amazement. Like, what? Why in the world are you taking me off? And then he was like, no, don't take me off. Wasn't that – weren't they still only up a goal at that point? Oh, gosh. I'd have to look. I can't uh, remember. Because I remember see. like going, no, please do not sub him off and put on Martinez. This would be a disaster. Uh, F F Junka and Quinon came on at 66, so they were up 2-1 at that point. Yeah, they were only up a goal yeah. at that point. And yeah. I was like, why would you take him off? You sat in the last game. Yeah, and then they scored, and Jimenez came on at 79, like eight minutes after they scored for Jesus. That was fine. Yeah. And then the late sub, Martinez and Sealy's late. You know, 86th for that one. See, this is one of those deals where I worry that analytics and data over becomes overthinking for common sense. 
Well, I guarantee you, for example, that the Junka and Kenyon subs, I guarantee it, were minute subs. Because Junka came, the, you know, the 65, 66 minute, you know, really that's a 65 minute sub. It just takes them a minute to get them on. Junka coming on for two Amasi at right back. Two Amasi's coming back from injury. ER Mendy started, you know, two games in a row. That was surprising. You know, Facundo got, came out like at the, the last game and now he comes in at this game at the 60 minute. That's all workload stuff at that minute mark. I, 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 I would bet my bottom dollar on it. You know, the, the one with the Kosi later, that's a tactical adjustment they were making to go three at the back. You know, and I really hope that he wasn't, not to be a dead horse thinking about taking Tafari off because that would have been a horrible idea. I, I don't mind Jimenez for Jesus because Jimenez, Jesus has now played, you know, back-to-back games running his tail off. That one's okay. You know, not that Jimenez did anything, but it's like at that point you just take Jesus off to get him off. They don't have any other player to put on there except for him. I guess they could have put on saying, but that, you know, that's not so much better, but. Yeah, well, the second half was weird in the Salt Lake game, yeah. uh, just to the fact that they were, uh, they seemed to really catch Salt Lake off guard or switched off late in the game and pulling off the win. Not just a win, but a three goal win was uh, a huge achievement. And as I said earlier, so important to the fate of this season. Those are going to be three really, really important points. The, the Ariola goal was a really nice goal. Um, I think Omarion caught him napping, and that kind of broke their back when they, they got that PK given that we're in a, in a tough spot for them, you know, just a few minutes later, or literally six minutes later, mm-hmm. you know, that's a back to back like that is tough. Dallas will do that to you from time to time is they'll, if they get a goal, they can get another one quick on you in a hurry, you know, and, and really 71, that's another eight minutes later, nine minutes later. So, you know, eight minutes, nine minutes, three goals, 17 minutes total. That's a pretty big backbreaker, you know, and the Arsenal spirit was broken at that point. So when you get to Columbus on Saturday, um, what do you anticipate we'll see in terms of mm. the starting 11? Well, pause is a no-brainer. Um, I think you see Farfan again. Um, it should be Nicosi and Martinez should be the three-man rotation at center back. Those are those, you know, those three guys for two spots. Um, you'll see, I think you'll see Junka come back as a starter at right back. Mm-hmm. Um, because Tuomasi is again still struggling from uh, you know injury and fitness coming back from all that stuff. And Junka did a really nice job, so I think that'll rotate back was in. Was his sub last night just for cramps, or did he just wear out? I think he just wore out. I think, you know, I think it's as much as anything. Like I said, I think that what an injury, was though. Uh, I don't think he was injured. I think it was just, you know, 65, 66 minutes. That's a nice, solid, like, two-thirds of the game kind of minute mark. You know, that's a – again, I think that's a scripted moment. Right. And, which is why – and part of why I think it leads into the idea that Junka will start the next game and then – you know, two Amasi can come in for him or for Farfan, maybe, you know, since Farfan will have started, gone 92 in a row, you know, there's some options there is, is the point. And then in midfield, um, Facundo should come back. Um, unbelievably, I think potentially you got, you'll, I think there's a really good chance Alan Velasco's back. Um, there was some clips of uh, training from midweek and he was participating full on in training. So I think that's a really good sign that he'll be available this weekend. So that leaves you either E.R. Mendy or Paxton. Um, obviously, in terms of pure talent, you would want to start E.R. Mendy, but he's just gone back-to-back games. So maybe you flip, but then so I would have said the same thing about Paxton. Getting Paxton for three straight starts would be crazy. So like, which one of those guys goes may just depend a little bit on how they're both feeling this week. Um, I would I would bet that the, the, the long-term goal this season is a Facundo – ER Mendy double with Allen in front of them. So I kind of lean in that direction in the midfield there. And then that leaves you up Trump, Jesus, and Paul Ariola again, of course, and probably Obreon still. You know? <laughs> I mean, look, I know we'd like to have Bernie or we'd or we'd like Ansa to do really well, or maybe we'd like Dante Seeley to like have a breakout moment, but none of those things have happened. And Obreon's had two pretty solid games. You know, it would be really hard to bench Obreon coming off of that RSL game where he was for him really good, you know, and, and by most measures, pretty good, you know, not, not elite, not Jesus, not Paul, but pretty contributing and, and not making any brutal mistakes that I remember. So I think that's, that's really it. Those three are kind of going to be locked in and, and then the rotation in the back. Uh, and then just the one big question with the R. Mindy and Paxton and, and I'm leaning ER Mindy. Okay. Uh, related to the Salt Lake game, a couple things I meant to ask you about. Sure. This Frazier guy. Yeah. 
is he not the most invisible player yeah, I know. you've ever seen? <laughs> He's just on the field. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I will say that like of the games he's played, I thought this was his best one, but I don't really know what he's doing other than like, he's there. He passes the ball back to you when you pass it to him. You know, he kind of covers the ground he needs to cover. He didn't get um, in foul trouble or get a card or anything. He kind of just clogged it up. And I think that basically is what he is. You know, he's just a guy who clogs it up and, Look, when you're, when you're trying to go on the road and stifle the game and not let the other team get anything going, you know, that's not horrible. Now, granted, okay. in the first half, RSL had some good chances, but I think they kind of went around the sides. I think they kind of they weren't going right at the gut that I remember, you know, so I don't put that on him per se. You know, I, I, I would be hard pressed to tell you one thing he did that was any good other than Dallas won three to one. You know? Yeah, I, it's not like I could sit there and point out a bunch of bad things he's done either. Right. It's just that it's I, like of all the times that I've seen him play at the end of the game, I think I go back and kind of run through who played and I go, yeah. I don't remember a thing that guy did the entire game. And I don't know yeah, I if know. I could ever say that about anybody before. It's just well, it's a weird mystery to me. Some of his previous games, he had some defensive performances that made me kind of be like, oh, wow. For a guy that was supposed to be defensive, but yeah, in this particular game, it was just you know, so he was weird. Just there, I mean, he, <laughs> you know, he he um, he had a, a block. He had cut two intercepts, a couple of clears. You know, it's what's like, his passing percentage since you're uh, looking at stats? Is yeah, it say? he he had five recoveries. That's not bad. You know, so passing was uh, he had 64 touches. That's that's solid. That's like yeah. second on the team, maybe. Uh, 84%. That's not horrible for central midfielder, five progressive passes. That's decent. You know, so it's like, whatever reason, man, the dude is almost invisible. You know, he's just, just an average guy. Sometimes that's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Just to be an average guy. Sometimes you just need dudes that can fill up some minutes and not burn you. And this game, he didn't burn like the previous couple of times he played, he burned him once or twice in this game. He did not. So do that. Every time you play, you're fine. Yeah. But here's the deal. Um, Cerillo and Cervania were both also just kind of average MLS midfielders, but I never felt like I didn't notice them in the game. Yeah. Well, Cerillo gets a, a knock, but he honestly was leading this team in progressive passing over the, until they traded him. I know people dog on the guy, but like there was a lot of things he does pretty yeah. well. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he, he definitely was good for like a, a, a a boneheaded mistake, but he also was 20, you know, 21, 22 or whatever he was, but I'm an Edwin fan. You know, I, I wasn't, I, you're right. Even with Cervania or Edwin or whoever, you would notice them. The guy's like a ghost. <laughs> Frazier yeah, is. It's and very he, strange. I mean, I just looked at his numbers, right? Those are some decent numbers. And it's like, I hardly even knew he was in the game. It's I know. really funny how that. Maybe I'm just so fixated on Yuri Mendy that I don't notice him. Maybe that's like when you're yeah, playing next that's... to Messi, you don't notice Busquets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I notice Busquets. Yeah, me too. I do too. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. by the way, for those listening to this podcast, I hope uh, everybody got to hear my interview with uh, Victor Uoa. Uh, a couple weeks ago on the kick around. If you haven't, go back and find the episode. It's from a couple of weeks ago. It's the last segment of the show. I got to call him. I, we, we were on the, we got to do like a 10, 15 minute interview. It's great. Victor is fantastic. Listen to him talk about playing with Messi and the day he found out Messi was going to be his teammate, telling the story about getting his Barcelona jersey signed by Messi mm, that he bought yeah. years and years ago. It's a, it's a ton of fun. So I hope everybody got to hear that. Well, the most important guest on that show was the segment immediately before that, which is. Oh, that's right. Buzz segment. was on that. That's right. You can listen to Buzz talk about Dallas, the segment before. Yeah. So you should have... now, but yeah. <laughs> um, all right. The other thing I noticed last night is Dante Seeley comes on the field. Yeah. And he, you could tell he had a moment where he turned the ball over really bad in the attacking third of the field, and then he just stopped. He did. And he stopped for about a full beat, and then all of a sudden you could tell either somebody screamed at him or something in his head fired off, and he started sprinting back. Yeah. And I just thought that was really funny because – it was just that moment in time where he just kind of like quit and bailed out on everybody after he lost the ball. I just thought was a very it was a, a teachable yeah. moment. <laughs> That's a really important moment because 
um, historically, Dante Seeley has not played a lot of defense. He kind of was an offensive guy and then just kind of like did a surge, you know, dest after that. So to see him a doing that uh, in terms of historical context is great. And then B earlier this year, there's been some moments where he's come in for another last 15 minutes or so and needed to defend. And he's only put in about 80% effort on the defending. He hasn't, you know, he hasn't put in a hundred percent effort to close guys down a hundred percent effort to chase guys down this game. He did that. Like even on the outside wing one time, uh, Jun- uh, not Junko, Farfan got caught up and Sealy got back and he really aggressively defended a guy down in that corner and ended up getting a good defensive play on the guy. And I remember specifically that play you were talking about because he did stop and I thought to myself, oh, Dante, and then he immediately busted it. And so for that life f- to come on his head. And he may have been the guy that won or at least helped win the ball back at the yeah. top of their box. He, he at least challenged and put the guy under pressure and affected the play, if not actually won it outright. Yeah. But the good part was the click in the brain of, oh, man, I have got to get back. And he put in maximum sprint, you know, Deadpool maximum effort to get there. And that's great. When you see a kid with the light clicking on like that, I love that. That is, that's a great moment. Even though it's a moment, a bad moment we turn the ball over, it's a great moment for him learning process to be like, Oh, you know what? I better, I'm going to earn it and he's going to go get it and, and not quit. That's great. I love it. Well, uh, two games that we obviously were very concerned about, but they ended up, uh, getting, uh, four points out of the two games. I've, Probably feel like they wish they had gotten a full six. It certainly would have gone a long way to making the playoffs this year, but yeah. uh, you'll take it and run with it as they get into the into the next game. What so uh, injury wise? We talked mm. about Legette, who in yep. you know, the hot rumor is he's done. Um, uh, Velasco coming back. Anybody else that we need to think about in terms of injuries? Well, Giovanni Jesus is now out. You know, with the ACL, that's going to be. Um, uh. Till you know early of next year, if if not middle of next year, so that's going to cause some headaches this winter. Um, other than that, Paul's back spasms seem to have come through okay. You know that happened against Seattle, and he was fine against RSL. Paxton seems to have held up. That that's good. Oh, Jesus has asked to come out. Basically, I don't know if you noticed in the broadcast. Yes, and he was touching. He his sat groin. down. He was touching that spot right above that kind of hernia kind of spot, which is worrisome. Obviously, we don't have more info yet, um, or, or I don't. Maybe somebody else does, but I don't. And um, the question, the worry will be, hopefully he sat down when he first started to feel a little something and not when it was like, crap, I just tore it. We're going to find out, aren't we? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we're going to find out. I, I bet you they won't tell us before Saturday <laughs> against the crew. Because no. if he's done, they're done. Because oh, you yeah. cannot, you're not going to win squat with him in as. You'd have to go with, O'Brien or Ansa at the nine or maybe Sealy because you can't bring Mulatto back because you're past your, you're past the roster freeze date. So the roster's frozen. So you can't do that. You can't activate anybody. You're really just totally screwed if he's down. Um, you know, they would battle through it and they would try and fight through it. And, co- and coach is adamant, like even like without the microphone running, you're just talking to him. He's adamant that they believe in everybody that they're like, you know, there's, I asked him if there's any throwaway games where you just like screw it, play the bottom 10 guys. No, it's like, it's always going to be man management and careful rotation to try and win it. Give yourself a chance in every game. You know, they believe that everybody can help them. I think they're not quite, I don't think that's quite true. I don't know if they really believe that or not, but that's what they're going to say, you know, but they're definitely going to act on that. They're never, there's not going to be, you're not going to see like, you remember a couple of years ago when New York Red Bull came here and they rolled out like the bottom 10 dudes on the roster. It was a bunch of supplemental guys and kids. Yep. And it was like, everyone's like, Oh, it's going to be a walkover. And they, they beat Dallas three, nothing. If I think it was here in Dallas with basically their scrubs, uh-huh. but like this coach is not going to do that. So you're not going to see that hundred percent. Just give up game. Like Shellis did it too. You remember? Yeah. The uh, Columbus game. Yeah. When Shellis pulled that. Oh no, that was Oscar in Columbus. He, no, it's Shellis did it. And he, he loaded up to win the open cup game and he, took the league game and he played a bunch of scrubs and he put all the stars yeah. in the open game. So it does happen from time to time. This coach says that's not going to happen. So we'll see, take him at his word for now, but the, the Philly hmm. game would be the one if you're going to do it, that would be the one to do it. But I think there's a mentality there that they're trying to preach with this team. They're, not, they're never going to not compete. And that's, I'm okay with that in the end. Okay. Well, uh, I feel like we covered it pretty well. Anything else you want to discuss? Um, Sunday is the last North Texas game of the season. 
Um, they're not going to make the playoffs. You can, you know, the game's at home. So if you want to go out and see some guys, uh, you know, shortly after that, I'll have Who's my, the coach of that team? Um, John Gall, who's the, was the U19 coach. He's oh. come up through the FC Dallas Academy system as a coach. Yeah, no, I know who he is. I didn't know they had, <laughs> this is how little I pay attention to that yeah. thing. I didn't even, I knew they fired the guy they hired in the off season already. Yeah, he was new. He was U19 coach and director of uh, scout, not scouting, director of coaching in the academy this last year. And so he's retained or had retained director of coaching in the academy and gave up the U19 job to take the North Texas assistant job. And now he's their lead guy. And Chewy Vera took over the 19s. And Gall, you know this, Peter, probably, but a lot of people might know Gall did some nice things around here in town in terms of like high school soccer. And then he got into the academy and he has coached several teams in the academy. And he's pretty good at player development. Mm -hmm. It's pretty good at um, managing young men and helping them grow. Uh, you know, so it, it's a decent fit. It's a guy you know what you're getting in terms of the organization knows what they're getting. So, like, is he going to get the full time job? They haven't named him yet. It wouldn't shock me though because he he knows the system. He knows the FC Dallas way. He's been an integral part of the academy for quite a while. I don't I don't see anything wrong with just retaining the guy. Honestly, I, I don't know that he did enough to win the job outright, but there was some definite improvement after he took over. You know, and more of a focus on the domestic players and the academy players, and less focus on the farm players who all stunk it up this year. So. North Texas last game Sunday. Come on out and watch it. I'll be there. Okay. Go sit with Buzz. Everybody yeah. go to the game, sit with Buzz, have a third degree watching party. Well, I mean, it's a it's a it's a double header. It's a Saturday F C D Sunday, North Texas. You know, end of season. It's against Austin too. It's a rivalry game to finish it out. So. Whoa, whoa, hold on. Maybe I got so they're playing they're playing in Frisco, not in Arlington? No, 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 no. It's just back to back days. I just meant like it's a fake double header. Oh, oh. I was oh. trying to tell you that they were playing in Frisco. Oh, okay. It's in Arlington. All right. Yeah. Okay. I know you won't come because it's in Arlington, but everybody <laughs> else should come. <laughs> not, not to go see North Texas in a baseball stadium. No, I'm not. That doesn't uh, tickle my fancy. Come on, you can check check out uh, Hope of AU before he signs with FC Dallas. Okay. Um, I'll just. How about you just report back to me and give okay. me an update? I'll, I'll uh, let you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, as usual, it'll be a you know North Texas gut job. There's not a lot of keeping guys around a long time unless there's some pretty heavy progression. So there's going to be a, as always, a cleaning out of that thing. No, nah, it's a sausage factory. Yeah, because other than the academy kids are always fun to come through. That'll be a good bit. Um, there's a couple guys doing some good things in you know college soccer from FC Dallas. I Stone's doing well. You know. Shout oh, is to, he? Yeah, he's been starting every game for Duke. Um, shout out to Malik Henry Scott, who's Tariq Scott, sorry, Tark Scott's older brother, uh, brother who's at Tulsa and is having a banger of a year. He's a good, solid player. So he, he's got, I think, five goals in six or seven games, I think, to start the year. So good player. Keep an eye on him. That's exciting stuff. Yeah. Um, oh, the other, the other weird thing is that we should talk about this again and remind everybody that Dallas now has a UPSL team. Which is the, the the national amateur league? Yeah, right? yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So yeah, they those games apparently all of them are on YouTube. So if you're the, the it, first, isn't that what the Vaqueros play in? No, the Vaqueros play in NPSL. Oh, okay. You said yeah. UPSL. Okay. UPSL. Yeah. So the they the Dallas has played three games. The first game was the U19s played. The second game the U17s played and won. <laughs> and the third game the U19s game. Played and won. The only game they've lost is the first one against 4-0, which they were winning until they got a red card and they ended up losing 4-1 to one after they got a red carded. So it's fascinating to watch these kids basically play against like elite level mid 20s amateurs. They're not guys that were pros, but they're guys in that league that want to be pros or used to be pros or are semi pros or whatever. And sometimes the kids from the academy, like it can just show you that even though they're kids in the academy, they play at a remarkably high level compared to what the average soccer player plays because they, this game last night, which was against Texas Spurs, I think Spurs made it to like the quarterfinals last night or last year. And the SC Dallas team just bossed them. It was five, nothing at halftime. Where do they play those games on the Dr. Pink turf field up oh, there wow. at uh, Toyota stadium? That's Why would the they do that? Field. You have to have that league has um, requirements for lighting and stands it's uh, it's substantial enough that you have to have something, and the only thing Dallas has that fits that bill is the Dr. Pink field, you know. And they stream the games, the, so they're on all YouTube, of those so. field. Well, I guess they don't have enough stands. Not enough stands on a grass field, you know, or maybe day. not enough lighting. Like Pink probably has a little more lighting because it's like a high school football field, basically. Uh, no, I've, so, I've played. Uh, no, all of those fields up there are perfectly well lit. Yeah, okay. they just don't have stands. Yeah, 
I would. I'm kind of surprised they don't just go throw some of those metal stands and do enough well, just know. to qualify, just so you could play on grass. But, Money. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Oh. The academy kids are used to it. They they play on that field from time to time. They train on that field from time to time. It, you know, they're it's not a problem for them. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. But if you've ever been interested in an academy at all, this is a way you can see some now without having to go out there because all the games, all these games are on YouTube, and you can watch these kids play against adults. It's kind of cool. Hey, Buzz. Yeah. When can we start uh, uh, asking questions about what the new home shirt's going to look like next year? Well, you can ask all the questions you want. I'm, I'm not getting any uh, good no. leaking info. Um, look, my Have only, we heard anything? No, I've got nothing this time, man. They're doing a really good job. The only thing I would say is that I really, really hope that they're consistent now. They, so for the last three or four versions of the home jersey, it's been mostly red with some sort of hoopish whatever now listen you and i both want legit 100 percent red blue hoops but we're not going to get it probably i like to i like to call the blue in the last three or four uh iterations of the shirt not hoops but foops foops yeah yeah hints <laughs> fake teases. hoops yeah foops yeah, yeah that's a good name for them uh twoops i don't know they're not they're not even oopsy parts sometimes but I'm, I'm hoping they at least maintain some consistency with that you know mm. i mean like it's not what i want but at least be be something where people know the look and they recognize the look. Consistency of branding, right? A million times I've talked about this to death, you know. So I don't I don't have any dirt on that. I mean, obviously we know we're getting the burn kit again, the burn baby burn thing, you know. Like if they were to change the home look away from red ish tops and blue ish pants to something else, I would be disgusted. <laughs> you know what I mean? Despondent. You know, listen, I've said for years that I would prefer white shorts, but it's like, well, now you have a brand. You've established that look. Okay. Stop. Don't change it. You picked something. Stick with it. Don't change it. Yeah. It's funny. I was having this thought the other day uh, when I saw that Seattle is about, I think on the sometime next week, I think Seattle yeah. is going to reveal a new badge. What are they doing? And some sort of branding change. And I keep thinking to myself, I, I I don't know why you would do that. I don't know. It's like, it's almost feeling like it's a, ans <laughs> answering a question that nobody asked. Or yeah. maybe maybe everybody in Seattle has always hated the Space Needle Crest. I, you know, I know it's a little loud and crazy, and it's not as retro cool as some of the older Sounder stuff is. But, man, unless they absolutely nail it, uh, it is going to be a real, uh, it's going to be a laughable. And it, it dawned on me the other day, Buzz, and I can't believe I'm about to say what I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. If if the Hunts announced that they were about to do a rebrand of the club, even if it was just, a, a just a, what, to whatever extent, everything from just changing the badge to completely changing everything, I'd be, I can't believe I'm saying this. I would scream, no, please don't do it. Yeah. Because at this point, as much as I have from day one hated the rebrand from Burn to FC Dallas and everything about it, yes, Buzz, even down to the red and white hoop shirts, mm -hmm. I, at this point, it's been almost 20 years. Everybody knows what FC Dallas is, as yeah. stupid as that is, and the fact that they don't have a nickname and all of that stuff, it would be an absolute disaster to change it now well what i said when they rebranded in the first place was that 100 years from now fc dallas as a name will be fine well it's faster than that at 20 years later that name is fine you well know, not only that the rest of the league copied yeah, them you've spent you're right it was a sea change moment the whole league changed you have spent 20 years whatever it is with this badge that you have now like i get it. it's a little clip already i fine but a lot of people really like it don't change it it's fine. It's now the oldest logo left in the league. There's, it's the oldest logo in the God, league. I so cannot believe it's amazing that it's the oldest logo in the league. And that includes Seattle, who's about to change yours again. Once New England changed, that that blood made Dallas the oldest, which is stunningly insane. Now, to, on the red and white hoops, I never said red and white hoops. I originally said red and black, and then they changed to red and blue. I was like, okay, make it red and blue. But the whole point of the hoops is to have the whole hoop be dark-ish. That way, a white number pops on it. Right, right. That's what I wanted. That's what I suggested. The red and blue, wasn't, red and white, wasn't what I suggested. So I agree with you. The red and white hoops wasn't very good, but you know there are ways to make red and white hoops look better. There are teams that have red and white stripes that look great, like Chivas or Atletico Madrid. There are ways to have red and white hoops that look good. They just didn't do it. 
you know, still not what I wanted, but I'm with you. Like if, if they were to try and rebrand now, that would be so stupid. They have so many bigger problems. They're finally starting to make traction. So I try to do great things. Don't throw that away. And I don't think they're gonna, no, I, I can't I, believe Seattle's doing this. In fact, I think it's ludicrous, but no, it was just, it, I only bring it up because I saw that Seattle was doing it. And it, I yeah. thought about, because I mean, you know, there was a significant period of time where I was praying that Dallas would rebrand for a second mm. time because yeah. I hated the FC Dallas and, and hoops and the red and white shirts so much. Cause it just was, uh, and, uh, but now I'm like, okay, it, uh, you win. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah. it's whatever just please don't change it again don't make us go start over with this again uh, um, I mean, you know the the academy for whatever reason the academy almost always defaults to the the red and blue hoopish top with the white, with the white shorts. shorts and, and either the red so socks good. or the blue socks and it looks so good and like 99 percent of people that see it think man that looks amazing there's a, there's one percent that don't like the white shorts and i understand that but I think, like, the, to me, that's my only complaint about the Dallas kit in general, the home kit now we're talking about primary, is, A, now stick with the consistency you got, it, except that it's all very dark and muted, and it all muddies together, and it needs properly done, very subtly done whiteness on it to pop. Uh, what The white numbers need to be a very crisp white. It needs a little bit of white trim, and the white shorts, more than anything, would just make the red top, blue top. Yeah explode and look so good as it does every time there's an academy game uh now you know look, they're never gonna listen to us and it's it's too complicated for terms of i think the reason they don't is because of it complicates all the kit problems for everybody else in the league but colorado runs a you know mismatch kit you know all the time now that a days and there's a couple other teams that enter miami do, no they don't are salt pink somebody else does too oh seattle does with their green and blue Right. You know, so like, well, that mold's been broken, man. There's no reason why you can't do it now. You know, look at how good in a way, sort of the way Man U looks or Mexico looks with those, you know, the tar the darker other colors in the white in the middle. It's just really good. And it could be really good whether you actually have real hoops or not. It would be beautiful, but they won't. I don't think. Do you see how I did that, Buzz? Do you see how I made a kit talk segment yeah. out of complete nothing? Out of Seattle's rebrand. Maybe that. you suckered Steve Davis into hanging around through that talk. No chance. No chance. He would no chance. Been, uh, he went to bed five, ten minutes ago. He probably got off at North Texas talk. But that's what makes me a professional. <laughs> you are a the, professional. Yes. Segway. Yeah. That's right. I am I am the master. Yep. All right. Well, uh, hopefully we get a red shirt with blue foops again next uh, next season. God, I um, hope they'll screw this up. <laughs> <laughs> Like it's like here's an example. Like as much as the the Ranger blue kit was so good, right? What if they rolled that at look out as like the next home kit? Because you know the road no. kit is now white top black shorts. So there is a recognition that you can do white and dark together. So what if all of a sudden the home red turned into home powder blue with the white like we saw? Don't no. do it. Don't. Do I mean, it. just I... wait. Just do that again for the road kit after the. Yes. Burn baby burn goes away. Bring back the ranger for the road kit again. Goodness gracious. It would be Look so at us. awful. Just stick with what you're doing. It's working. Just don't. Yes. Don't fuck it up. Uh, and Ooh. we have no reason to complain about it, really, because they've not announced. We have no idea. Nothing. We have no clue anything's happening or anything's really changing. We just yeah. worry. We've never because, gotten zero leaks before. It's bizarre. Here, history. Uh, you know. Well, they're on the warpath that never let us. You know, that's like their number one thing is to not let us learn about kits stuff. <laughs> like that's they true care, they don't care about anything else but that sometimes i think well maybe uh it's a bit off we're ways away from seeing a new shirt i just yeah. wondered if maybe we had you'd heard something along the way well the uh, weird thing is that people in the organization will have been seeing it since like january yeah right i mean like dan hunt would have approved it in the middle of last year they would have approved the new kit for this upcoming that's how far out they get approved so like the three or four or five people in the org will have already known about it for basically at this point more than a year, like a year and four or five months probably. Okay. So it's a miracle. It's amazing that they managed to keep it a hundred percent under the hat. Maybe there'll be some, go back to doing some of the little teasers that they do where they put out a little piece of fabric or something. And, oh, that will absolutely happen when it comes yeah. closer to time. Hopefully We're more so. likely to find out from some completely fifth party that got a hold of the Adidas catalog. Yeah, that's uh, usually how we find out. Uh, yeah, is, yeah, is what's going to happen. All right. Hey, I hope uh, uh, Dan's uh, corn rowing of his beard went well. I can't wait to see the photos. We could have a truck update. 
Oh, it's sorry. not totaled. If they did not total your truck, that's total, good. No, yeah, that's good. Yeah. So okay. Did they throw the bitch in jail? Uh, I don't know. I, I wasn't involved to pass that. Oh, okay. I told you that she tried to call me. That was funny, I thought. but Yeah. Sneaky woman. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm just happy that my car's not totaled. So I'm I am it. too. Yeah. All the parts will be here this week and hopefully I'll get it back. Right now it's scheduled early October to get it back. So like first week of October. Are you going to have it painted a different color? No, no, no. Because they'll just oh. match the front. Mm. It's not damaged that badly. It's just a... Okay quarter panel in the door i have to replace basically so my goodness all right well thank you for that update you're I'm welcome glad that you're getting i know <laughs> i'm sure everybody was, <laughs> was wait, waiting but he fast forwarded all the yeah. way to this part because that's breathless. all they really they don't care about the stupid soccer they that's why that's, that's right yeah <laughs> thank god uh, yeah Third Degree, the podcast is brought to you by Soccer90.com, the ultimate destination for FC Dallas, North Texas Soccer Club, and European gear. Right now is the North Texas Soccer Club end of season sale with 50% off all that sweet merch. Hurry, this offer is only good while supplies last. Third Degree listeners get 20% off your order when you use the code Third Degree at checkout. But, you know, remember, some exclusions do apply. Okay, there we go. Um, and we made it through without talking about the red card. I'm very proud of us for not doing that. Which red card was that? The one that didn't happen. Oh, yeah. Salt, yeah. Um, all right. Very good, Buzz. Thank you. Uh, hopefully, we'll talk to Dan again sometime soon. But thank you, Buzz, yeah. for all your expert insight and wisdom, sir. Thank you. And thank you, FC Dallas Curious fan. We will speak to you next week after how many games will it be? Will there be two more two or three? More. Two, two more, more games. Two more games in hand on the next episode of Third Degree, the podcast. Dan. Come back. Third degree, the third degree net podcast. Third degree, the third degree net podcast. Third degree, the third degree net podcast. Third degree, the third degree net podcast.